Attributes you think are needed for someone to be classed as a good coach? What do you reckon? Anything? Humor. Humor? No, I, I agree with that actually. Yeah. Flexible. Flexible, yeah. Knowledge of the game. Knowledge of the game. Passionate. Passionate. Patient. Patient. Consistent. Consistent, what do you mean by that? And how you are? Yeah. You mean okay, good. Positive. Positive. Player center. Okay. What do you mean by that? Um, the focus of activities and drills and the development is on the player, not so much your coaching style or how you want to implement. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Come back to that one. Realistic. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Just um, knowing what your players can do. Mhm. Mm is it okay to push on that? Yes. Yeah, so it's okay to push them out of that, that comfort zone a little bit. Any more? Interaction. What do you mean by that? Like hands on, doing, actually demonstrating. Demonstrating, so interactive was the answer. Demonstrating, yes. If you don't feel comfortable demonstrating, who else could you get to do that? The players, right? Because the players, for a reason. Okay, so I just put down a few um, ones that came to my mind. Um, Prepared, and I will admit, I'm the worst session planner <laughs> that has ever walked in the history of coaching. Um, I'm not great at writing it down. I'm like the worst advocate for the web-based session plans because I am old school, write it down on a sheet of paper. But I think that's something that is different for everybody. You know, some people are very much um, about, they have to be prepared, hours before, weeks before, days before. Some people have in their mind what they want to do, but wait till the last minute, procrastinators. I'm a procrastinator in life. Um, and everybody's different in that way. And I think um, you have to be prepared, but you have to be prepared in the way that works for you, all right? Would be my thing. Time management, I think this one can go across different ways. Time management in terms of Go to the first one, be prepared. So it's fine to do it your own way and prepare in your own way. But I think the biggest thing about time management is not making people wait. So players, as an example, turn up, especially at my level, and it's their job, right? They turn up, they get told to be there at a certain time. They get told that the session's going to be running at a certain amount of minutes, and they don't want to be waiting around. So. It can be time management in terms of making sure that the session's ready, but within the session, making sure that things flow. So there's not a big stop-start between different practices and big different drills. And I think that's a big one over my experience that I've learned is a huge part of preparing the session, is making sure that the session can flow throughout without the players having to stop for a long period of time wait for you to set the next thing up, etc, etc. Commitment to your team and to yourself. So I think something like this is a commitment to yourself, I would say. Um, taking the time out of your day, taking the time out of your weekend to commit to learning new things. Um, commitment to your team. Um, I think someone brought it up actually in the panel about getting to know who people are. You know, each... I've whatever it is, 20 odd women in my team, they're all very different, different personalities come from different backgrounds, um, different areas of the country, different countries of the world, and without knowing that about them, it can make the locker room a very, very lonely place, but once you start to know that about them, I think it enables them to actually feel more comfortable around each other. Confidence is an interesting word to me, because I think sometimes people perceive confidence in different ways. Um, I feel the most confident on a field. That's where I feel that I'm at my best. Um, I'm actually pretty socially awkward when I don't know people. Um, but people who know me laugh that I feel comfortable doing things like this because if you put me in a group of four, I would be the person that doesn't speak. But standing up in front of all you lot, 
I'm okay, I'm all right, I can deal with it. So I think being confident in whatever you feel confident doing and gradually the more you put yourself out there, the more confident you'll get in all the different things that you don't feel too comfortable in. Communication, um, I think those that watched the session last night probably work out, I have a loud voice and I can whistle, so that helps me um, when I'm coaching. Um, and I think that communication is in loads of different ways, right? I think the way that we perceive ourselves, body language, the way we act in front of the players, and I think that what, what I love about my job the most is I could be having the crappiest of days, but the moment I get out on the field with the group, it's like nothing else matters. You know, nothing else matters. This is what it is for the next whatever it is, 90 minutes. And that's the great thing about my job, I think, is that 90 minutes that I have on the field is I have no phone. I have, that's why I hate the Apple Watch. Actually, I'm wearing it there. I'm more than crazy. Um, no one can contact you. You know, this is it. And I think that within that, the players then feel that whatever you're saying to them and however you interact with them, um, they get the best out of you. And I think that communication can be in loads of different ways in that way. And I think that one thing I've learned with my teams working at an adult level is they want to know everything. We're women, right? That's what we, we can, we can analyze stuff and deal with things when we know what it is. So even to the minutest of detail around our travel plans for if we're going to play on a, whoever, Portland or whatever, giving them the most amount of information possible and letting them digest it in any way that they need to, because then when we don't give them that bit of information and it's a little bit secretive, paranoia. It's paranoia set in. And they can't deal with it. Right? So I think that was something that I learned working with 20 women, that being able to communicate with them and give them all the information and then just let them digest it however they need to was a, was a huge part of my um, development as a coach. Punctual. Players laugh at me. If we keep up at seven, I'm there at two. I don't know what I do. I have no idea. <laughs> no one comes to see me sometimes. I dance, I sing, I have my own little party, and then by the time they turn up at like 5.30 or whatever, I'm like a cage animal. And they're like, you are nuts. And I can't, but I can't do it anyway. Can't do it any other way. Like if I don't turn up that early, I feel like I'm not prepared. And I literally do nothing. I sit on a chair, but as long, until I get to that stadium, I'm not ready. So I am, um, a killer on punctuality and we trade in the mornings and whatever, the meet time's 9.45, I'm there at 8. So if I don't get there early, I'm not ready. And I'm, I'm an extreme. I will admit that. But I think that's a biggie. Like, you should never... Someone taught me this actually on a trip that I was with Dawn. I think when you're training, going out training sessions, games, you should be the first one that they see. But when you're doing something where you meet them, and there's a meeting point, and then you're going off to the whatever the next thing is, be the last person there. Be the last person there, make sure you're not late, be the last person there so they know when you get there, things matter. And if they get there after you, you won't wait for them. And you make them be ready for you, and you not be ready for them. That's what I saying. Um, knowledge, something that someone brought up before, of the game is important. Um, and I think that one of the things I, I said this about my dad when I was younger, one of the things I learned very, very early about coaching, don't watch the ball, watch everything around it. Because actually what someone does when they have the ball is probably the thing as a coach you can affect the least. But everything that they do prior to receiving the ball or being anywhere near the ball is what you can probably affect the most. So that was one of the things that I learned pretty early. Knowledge of your players, like I said before, I think um, one of the things that I really enjoy is getting to know who they are. And obviously I work with adult women, so are they married? Do they have kids? Where did they come from? What college did they go to? All that type of stuff. I don't try not to know any of it before I meet them. So that it's a blank sheet of paper when we first meet and I can get to know them as a person, right? And I've obviously had players in my team who have celebrity status, let's call it. People like Megan Rapino and Hope Solo. Yeah, I knew little bits about them and what they've done in their careers, but getting to know them as people 
is very different to getting to know them as what whatever, their name says that they are, right? And I think it's only fair to them that I do that, that I get to know who they are, what makes them tick, what pushes them forward, what they like, what they don't like, blah, blah, blah. And I think then, as I've got older, I think that's why now I have a good relationship with players that I coached 10 years ago to co players that I coach now is I know them as people. So I think that that helps then when you have to have the hard conversations or when you have to have the great conversations or good things happen to you as a team, it means more, right? It means more because you know each other as people and what it's taken for you to get there. Know your environment too. And I think this is something that especially in the US is a, is a biggie is um, you know, what's the environment you're working in? I'm really lucky, I get to have a full field, I get to have a locker room to myself, I get all that stuff, but I think, especially in youth soccer here, what's your environment? So no point planning a session for 11 v 11 on a full field if you've got a quarter of a field. Right? And they're the realistic things that you guys have to deal with, right? And I think that knowing that, and being comfortable in that, and accepting that, um, my brother actually is a really good example, and I hate you saying this, he always complains about the things he doesn't have. And I'm like, well, just embrace the things you do have and make them really good, right? Because I think then you don't battle yourself because it's ultimately something you can't change. So embrace it and be the best to it, whatever that environment is. And obviously a quarter of a field is not the greatest thing for any coach, but how can you make it the best quarter of a field that you possibly can um, would be one of the things that I would advise. Belief, I think this comes with experience of Belief in who you are and what you think the best way to play the game is. Um, I was brought up in a way where I believed that if you had the ball as a team, you had a better chance of success because the other team doesn't have the ball, right? And then if you lose the ball, work as hard as you possibly can to win the ball back. So people ask me all the time, what's your philosophy? That's it. Take care of the ball when you have it, and if you lose it, go and work really hard to go get it back. And it's very bland, right? It doesn't really mean anything, but ultimately I'm like, that makes sense to me. And yeah, there's loads of nuances around that. And those of you who watched the session last night would have seen a little bit of the way I like my teams to play, but that's ultimately it. And then when you have different personnel and different players throughout your team, those things still stay the same, I think. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. Integrity, um, again, I think this goes back to being able to have very brutally honest conversations with players. And part of that is you have to know who they are. And if you can look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and know that you were doing, trying to do the right thing or you believe you did the right thing, then you'll sleep well at night. I think if you can't do that, then you've probably got to question yourself on that, that um, key point there. Approachable. I think every coach wants to be approachable and feel like they are approachable. But I think you have to work out who you are and what players you work with to decide if that's going to be the case. Players who come to me who've just left college, you know, just rookies, are scared to death of me. And I don't get it, right? It doesn't make sense to me. I don't feel like that I'm that scary. Um, so they don't think I'm approachable at all. They won't come and speak to me at all. They won't have coffee with me, nothing, because they're scared to death of me. And it's the environment often that they've come from that's been like that. So I think you have to work harder with some players than you do with us to, to make yourself approachable. And I'll keep, I'm going to keep touching on this. Be yourself. Be yourself. Don't try and be someone that you're not. Um, because players will always call BS. Always. And I'll learn harsh, harsh lessons on that. So, I'm going to come back to that one. So adaptable is probably the last one I would say. And I think in this country especially, you have to be very adaptable. Go back to the field space you often get, right? That's a biggie. The weather. So coaching in Southern California versus coaching in Seattle in the winter, very different. How we manage players in Seattle versus to how you manage players in Salt Lake at elevation, very different. Um, and it wasn't until I was here and lived here that I realised how different it was. So obviously we were based in the Pacific Northwest. It's sunny in the summer, but it's not humid. It's cold in the winter. We go and play in Orlando in June. 
well, that's very, very different. We go and play in New York in August, the humidity is ridiculous. We go and play in Houston in May, and players collapse through heat exhaustion because we play in the middle of the day. It wasn't until I experienced it that I realised how important it was to acknowledge that. And I think, you know, you guys can't always manage your schedule. But I think some of the things that Dawn talks about in terms of the preparation off the field to prepare players for this stuff, I think is so vital here. Um, and that comes down to being adaptable because as a coach, you might go, okay, we've got 90 minutes today and we've got to make sure we cover all these things, but it's 105 degrees. Well, you probably can't cover them. And if you do, it's probably going to mean that in your game that you've got in two days' time, that they're, they're not going to be able to actually execute what you've been working really hard and training to do. So they're always thinking about, number one, what's your player personnel like? Where are they in terms of players? Are they beginning of the season, pre-season, and they're really eager and want to learn? Well, utilise that time to learn. Often what? we get caught up in as coaches is pre-season, got to run. We've got to run in pre-season, it's got to be hard. Well, actually, in pre-season is normally when they're most valuable time for them to actually learn something. It's fresh, it's new, it might be a new team, new age group, new teammates. That might be the time to actually endorse all that stuff the most because the way that, especially you soccer here, your schedules are so crazy that all the stuff that you do in your training sessions if you just focus that around it being hard and running, then when it comes to the games, what are they actually learning? What have they learned in that week to take into that game to actually go and, they've learned that if they don't run, you're gonna shout, right? So can it be more than that? Can it be more than just that? Um, and I've touched on the rest. So I think that the biggie for me is just being really adaptable and, and I, hold my hand up that I am in a really lucky position that I get the facilities that I want and need. But I know that, you know, having seen youth soccer in this country especially, I think that's probably the most important one in youth soccer, is being able to be adaptable. And again, I go back to in embracing what you have and not getting caught up with what you don't. So if you have a court of a field, be prepared that you've got to be the, it's got to be the best court of a field you ever use, all right? Be yourself. Um, I've asked this question yesterday, actually, like, where do you find new material? What do you look for? How do you keep things fresh? And, and honestly, I don't have loads of time to do that, which I wish I did. I wish I had more time to go and watch people. Um, but I use social media, um, look at people, other people's sessions. But one thing I learned throughout uh, my experiences is there's no point watching someone else's session, so like my session last night, um, copying it and just doing it because it's not you it's not who you are I doubt that you the same as me you might be similar to me but you've got to make it into what you believe in so yeah use the good things that you think are great from the session chuck the things you don't think were great from the session and put them in the trash and add your elements to the sessions that are about you and what you believe in um, and I learnt, I've learned that a lot. And do I use other people's sessions and do I steal other people's ideas? 100%. But then I try and put them into what I believe is the right thing to portray that, all right? And then I think when, if you do that, you come across to the players like you believe in what you're doing. And I think I've played for a lot of coaches who I knew didn't really believe in what they were saying. And then I've played for coaches who really believed in what they were saying. I didn't necessarily agree with it, but I did what they asked me to do because they were really convincing that what they were asking us to do was the right thing to do. And I think that portrayal by a coach is gets your players buy-in so much, so much. And I tell this story a lot actually about Hope when I first started coaching in Seattle. The way she had been taught to organize her defenders around her goal was really different to how I wanted it to be. So she's probably, I don't even know how many caps she had at that point, but she had gold medals galore and God knows what else. So I was like, okay, I need her to believe and understand why I'm asking the defenders to do that. And after multiple weeks, 
she finally came up to me after many a confrontation of her saying, well, if this happens, what do we do about this? And if this happens, what do we do about that? And she said, this makes my life so much easier. And I was like, hey, that's my effort. I'm here to help you out, make your life so much easier. And I think it was just purely in the fact that I was willing to keep fighting and keep pushing on what I truly believed in that meant she bought into it. If I'd have wavered at any point, there's no way she'd have done it. No way. 